And so I think that was my second big crack crack was like, you go through a phase of, you know, it's not all true. And, and then you're, you love your commute. Well, I, I guess I'll speak for myself. I loved my community and I loved my family and I loved Mormonism so much that I would, I would just look at everything symbolically for the rest of my life if it were healthy. But it was like a light bulb went off and I'm like, this isn't healthy. This is starting to show signs of un- being unhealthy for my kids, for my teenagers. And it sure isn't healthy, this policy and to be treating uh, one group of people. I mean, this is how I feel like um, Joseph Smith tra- treated women. What they're doing today to the gays, that's what he did to women. Because I've read a lot of their stories. And I'm like, this is the same thing. It's happening really for the third time because the second time was blacks in the priesthood. So I start seeing this pattern of, I want to stay part of this community, but I can't, I can no longer say, but that was in the past. We're not doing it now. It's like, it was in the past. It was in the median and it's happening now. And nobody's stopping it. And nobody's talking about it. And I can go to Sunday school class, but I can't say what I think about it. I can't say what I think about history. I can't say what I think about the LGBT. I can't even talk about it. It's like, it's like I'm sitting there with my ta- mouth tape shut. My favorite song to this day is Pink's um, Wild Hearts Can't Be Broken. I don't know if you've heard that song, but it's like, there's not enough tape to shut this mouth. I mean, there was a point where I was like, I got to rip the tape off. I can't just, I felt like I was going to church and they were like duct taking me at the door. And um, not only were they duct taping me while I was there, but they were duct taping my mouth in my parenting. Because here I'm sending someone off on a mission and I can't even tell her what I believe or what I think. How, how, how is that healthy? Like, how can any group call themselves about the family if they're interfering with a parent's ability to teach their children, which is what I felt like they were starting to do? It's one thing to say it's not tr- true, but I'm going to look at it symbolically. It's another thing to say it's not healthy for me. It's, I'm a mama bear. And third thing, it's not healthy for my kids. I'm jumping. I, I'm not saying in something that's not healthy for my kids, and and we'll and I'll go through that right now. So my third wanted to go to B, he got into BYU. It's his life stream. Um, he ended up doing a little bit of BYU, a little bit of BYU Idaho, because our rule was um, he's the special needs. You have to do a full year and not have any problems before you go on a mission. <clears throat> so he did, and we went through the process with the bishop, um, and I was very adamant about like you know he. He's in the care of a therapist. Let's let's make sure that, you know, that I'm really worried about this. Shouldn't be sent foreign. So he gets called to Brazil. And I went, like the bishop emailed me. He's like, what do you think about his call? And I was like, you know, I'm going to throw up. And I think this is wrong. And I did. Because? I, he shouldn't be going to Brazil. I, he's, he's under the care of a mental health professional. He has terrible insomnia. And he needs to be close in case there's a problem. Like, you know, he already has bouts of, of he didn't, um, he was never clinically diagnosed with ADD because in my um, alternative days, I didn't want my kids to be labeled, but he clearly was. And um, he, he'd go back and forth between anxiety and depression. And the bishop was like, well, I don't know what to tell you, but yeah, I put, he goes, I'm pretty sure I put on there, don't send him foreign. I don't know why they did that. So it all comes down to the prophet. And my son would say the same thing. I'd say to him, I said, after his semester, because he got his call and then did another semester at Idaho waiting to go. And he'd had some bad anxiety and depression. I said, I think you need to tell the bishop that you're having these feelings, and I think you need to get reassigned. Like, this is probably not a good place for you to go. I'm going where the prophet told me to go. Like, you know, and I didn't want to be that mom that was like so overbearing that she overturned, and I, I have enough power. I could have done it. <laughs> In hindsight, I wish I would have. Um, this is reminding me, by the way, of, of you deciding to have lots of kids and, and to be a housewife. It's the authority telling you what needs to happen. Right. An unquestioning devotion to right. authority. But at the t- but, um, but I was fighting it internally, and at, I voiced it. I, I, I told the bishop, I said, the prophet doesn't know my son. My son can't go to Harmon's without losing his driver's license. He can't get on an airplane by himself and go to another country. He doesn't know the language. And he already has sleeping problems if one little thing in his life gets mixed up. I said, this is a badass idea. 
I could hear some of my listeners, uh, maybe their brains saying, well, this is a great opportunity because if he doesn't know how to be fully responsible and take care of himself, what a better way for him to, to learn and to figure it out than to be away from mom, be away from dad, be in a foreign country. And that's a great, a great way for him to learn. I thought all of those things too. <laughs> it's just, I mean, I thought them all. I was like, and that was the part of Mormonism. Now I'm like, why can't they just send them on service missions? So they're not out lying to people. But um, it, the part of me was like, well, maybe he'll, maybe this will be good. And, um, but here's the thing, like my brain and my heart knew it was a bad idea. And I, I mean, will never, I will never forgive myself for going against that because mm -hmm. I did go against that. I was like, okay, fine. It was the call. Um, and this is the, the clencher for me. Um, I also didn't tell him I didn't believe because by this time I don't believe any of it. So I'm lying really with, with omission to my kids. And the one thing I did tell him shortly before he went on his mission, I said, I said, son, I need to tell you something. I said, um, you got to remember, as a Mormon, when you go to church, when you go to BYU, when you go to BYU Idaho, and you're learning the history, you're hearing it from one perspective. So I gave him the analogy. I said, what would happen if you got in a fight with your brother, and you tell me, and then he tells me, is it going to be the same story? And he's like, no. And I said, so it's the same thing in Mormonism. So when you go on your mission, they're going to tell you these stories to tell. You need to remember it's just from their perspective, and they might not be all true. I said something like that. This was his response. Oh, some of them might not be true. Have you written to the prophet about this? I think he needs to know. And I'm thinking, I think he knows. But I don't, I, that was his response. But um, yeah, so I, I knew if I said too much, he would, it would ruin his chance to go in. And I did have, like what you said, well, he needs to get out. I would love to have someone else be in charge of this child for two years. You know how amazing that sounded to me <laughs> to be in charge of like, there's your money. And like, you know, I just wanted it to be stateside because I thought that would be the healthiest way to go for him. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's a, um, it's a juxtaposition that the church institutionally puts people in, which is super unhealthy, super abusive in my, not even in my opinion, it's super abusive to put a parent in a position where they have to choose, send my child on this wonderful thing that we've taught them is the most going to be the most amazing experience in their lives. And I still believe at this point in, in, in that time period that this is going to be the most amazing experience. And I don't want to screw it up for him, but I have to lie to, to, I have to lie or else not tell him the truth, which is the same thing to, for him to have that experience. What part of that sounds healthy to you? Like, Nobody should be in this position. It should not be. That's, that's why the number one thing on here is if you tell somebody that there's only one truth and one path, it's unhealthy. That's what all the psychologists say that study cults. That's not healthy. They need to stop saying that. What if we could keep all the good and get rid of most of the bad? Well, there's two things you could do and it would all be gone. It's number one and number 10 in this book. 10 the bishop interview process. It would literally solve 90% of the unhealthy abusive. Like, why wouldn't you want to talk about it? Why, why am I the bad guy? Why am I an apostate? Because I'm saying, let's do it the healthy way. I'm going to have kids and grandkids in this institution. Let's, let's make it better for them. And so um, his mission experience was horrible. He ended up coming home. Why was it horrible? What, he, can, you, what can you tell us? About? Okay, so he, um, first of all, they put him on a plane. And I, I told everybody this. I said, this is a bad idea. He's never even flown by himself before with nobody. He just shows up. So he doesn't have a partner. Commanding. I asked, I said, could you please assign him someone to Brazil? He has a list of like two pages worth of when he lands about how he has to find this. He has to find the authorities to check in. He doesn't speak Portuguese, by the way. And he's a, he, he's a very slow. Um, you do the MTC in Provo? No, go straight to Portugal. That's, oh. that's the other problem. Portugal or Brazil? Brazil. Sorry. Okay. I said the wrong name. Um, anyway, so I, just from a scientific standpoint, knowing this child, I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me get this straight. I'm going to drop him off at the airport. He's going to get on a plane. He's going to go to Brazil. He has to find the Brazilian authorities. He doesn't speak their language, by the way. He has to do a list of 10 things that I don't even understand. And I'm a grown A woman. And this is my ADD child who loses his driver's license every time he goes to the store. I'm like, this has disaster written all over just this one day. So um, anyway, so he gets there and he does get to the MTC, but um, they make them stay awake. They don't let him go to sleep. And this is a child who has to sleep. So he's been on this long international flight, hasn't slept, 
hasn't eaten, and that just spiraled his insomnia from the from day one. Mm. He was out of control insomnia, which leads to depression, which leads to anxiety. And then um, he was having trouble with the food there. The day they got there, they expected them to know the language. And this is a child who, he got good grades, but he had to work four times harder than everyone else to get good grades. So it takes him more time than a normal person to do everything. He's a hard worker, but uh, he can't just, okay, now I speak Portuguese. He can't do that, not even with the Spirit's help. He can't do it. I said Portuguese again. I meant Brazilian. But it's Portuguese, right? Yeah, yeah that's why I said that's okay. right. Anyway, so um, they just expect you, and you're, you get in trouble if you say a single word in English, like in really bad trouble. And so he's not sleeping. He's getting yelled at all the time, and he can't communicate with anybody. And um, he said they would do things like if he even wrote in English in his journal, they'd rip his journal pages out, throw them away, um, and um, yell at him if he spoke in English. And um, so he just starts the spiraling of, I, I, I think his, his MTC experience was extremely abusive. I would say verbally abusive. Um, that's just, you can't expect someone to come from another country, just snap on like the sleep schedule. I mean, even when you just travel, it takes you, even a normal person without insomnia, it takes a while. And it was just like, and, and the MTC president was so dominant and domineering, I'm assuming because the Brazilians and Spanish people are so laid back. He wants to set the tone of. And so my son said he, he would say, start saying things to them because he felt like he'd been sent to prison. He'd be like, I'm, I, I'm here of my own free will. You know that, right? He's like, I want to be here. I've been, I've been preparing for a mission my whole life. Why are you treating me like this? And then he'd get in trouble because he said it in English. And so then he starts getting really depressed. And he said, because he was in the care of a therapist, remember? Before he left, he goes, I need to speak to a therapist. I'm not, I'm not doing too well. I need to talk to somebody. And they said to him, well, we can't get you in for a few months. Mm. And so they said, unless you're suicidal. So, so then um, he comes back to them the next day. Okay, then I'm suicidal. Because <laughs> he's like, I just need to talk to a therapist. It's still not clear whether he was or he wasn't at that time. Um, it, it could go either way. But he gets in and um, starts having, and they aren't in-person meetings. They're over the phone with someone who speaks English. I think that was really helpful for him. But so then when he finally does leave the MTC, which he, he um, says is like leaving a, a concentration camp, <laughs> that's his description of it. He's already got a red flag on. This kid said he was suicidal. <laughs> so he, he gets out into the mission field and they put him immediately with a native set of Brazilians um, who don't speak English. And he's also got low blood sugar. So he's the type of person that needs to eat every two to three hours. But in Brazil, they don't eat anything all day and they eat a big, huge meal at dinner time. So he gets put in with these guys that don't speak the language. They don't have any food and they just wait. And they were hanging around doing nothing. They weren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. And at six o'clock, they go over to their friend's house and have this huge meal. Well, he starts getting like, he gets um, mood, mood swings if he's not eating normally. And so he starts having all these terrible mood swings because he's fasting all day. And then he's eating these huge meals, but they expect you to finish. And, um, and he knows that they're not teaching anybody. They're not doing anything. But he doesn't have he, the, the phone. He doesn't know how to use because he's not from the country. And so um, these, his companion and the people they're with just kind of like held him hostage. For a while because he couldn't call out. He didn't have a way of contacting the mission president. So he waits until there's a conference. And at the conference, at the end of the conference, he goes up to the mission president and says, I need to talk to you right now. And the mission president's like, well, this, can this wait? And he was like, no. So he goes and he says, um, this is going on. We literally are doing nothing. <laughs> I'm pretty sure on a mission you're supposed to teach somebody something. We're not doing anything. What were they doing? They were just... Just hanging out. All day, go, go and walk in them waiting for their free meal at six hmm. or a walk around. They would just walk around. Hmm. So he rats them out and then the mission president says, okay, thanks for telling me. And then sends him back hmm. with these guys, which you can imagine was a bad situation for him to be in. Because the mission president probably chewed out, chewed out the missionaries that were doing anything. Yeah, but, but he and sends then, them back with these natives sending, and they're all mad at him. Mad at him. And he was in a dangerous situation with them. Yeah. So then he had to be emergency kind of out of that situation and the mission president put him with, uh, but by now he's, oh, oh, and, and sorry, one other thing. Um, in their culture, if you don't eat the whole meal, it's like saying you don't love your mother. That's how he says it. So he was um, trying to finish these meals. And one time he just couldn't, and it was an investigator. And I don't remember which companionship it was in, but um, they actually went inactive <laughs> because he didn't finish his meal. 
And uh, the whole ward was mad at him. The Brazilians, they were mad at him. Well, there's the missionary that lost us our future convert because he couldn't finish his fourth plate of food or whatever, you know. And um, so it starts becoming apparent that he's having a sleep problem and a food problem. So um, the mission president at some point reached out to me and just said, "Where well, he's seeing a counselor, just so you know this is going on. And so I reached back out to him and said, he has low blood sugar. So I said, you need to make sure that he is that whoever he's with is taking him to the store and that he has something to eat for breakfast and lunch. And it comes back the same as that he's Brazilian. He's like, there's nothing wrong with the Brazilian food here. And he gets mad at me because I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm not saying anything's wrong with your food. I'm just saying he has a medical condition. If he does not eat regularly, he will have severe mood swings. This will be a problem. And he's already not sleeping. And you contacted me because he's having problems. Like, okay. And he would just get offensive about, uh, defensive about it and offended. But he transfers him to another companion who's like from Ple- Pleasant Grove. At least he can, he can, if he needs to, communicate in English. But by this point, he's so depressed. He's like barely moving. And he gets put with a companion who's like, let's go. Let's do this. And who like goes out and wants to Bible bash everybody. Because everybody there is really, you know, um, Catholic. And so he's like, but by this point he's lost his zeal. And he's like, he go, he said, we were having phone conversations regularly because this is when you could have phone, phone calls. And so, um, he, you could just tell he was going in and out of being depressed. And, um, but this companion's like, I don't care if you're tired, get up, we're going to go. And just pushing him when it was probably a bad time to be pushing him really. And then he didn't like that. He's like, I'm here to I just want to help people and serve people. I don't want to go argue with whose Bible is right and whose Bible. Like this doesn't feel like like nothing that's happening. And then there were there were there were Lamanite things brought up, and there were things about the four version for 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 that were brought up, which he had asked the MTC president or one of his teachers in the in the MTC. And this is what they told him. They said, "Don't you ever bring that up again." So you're talking about the first vision, multiple versions of the first vision, are are the Native Americans, Lamanites from the Book of Mormon, those types of questions. And he had asked that in the MTC, what do I do if I get asked this? And they said, don't you ever talk about that again. That's anti. Got in trouble for it. Then he gets asked about it in the mission field. And he's like, well, that's just anti-Mormon lies. That's what he tells them because that's what they told him, right? So anyway, he ends up coming home. He's just, and he comes home and he's just like a shell of himself. It's like he's three again. He's like three-year-old special needs little baby boy again. What did it do to him? What, what what made him want to, I mean, was there a breaking point or what what was it? it He just hit a breaking point and he called, they called and they said, we're sending him home. He's just not doing well. And I said, have you tried the sleep? Have you tried the food? Now that he's already there, let's at least try. But I didn't realize until he got home how bad it was. What do you mean? Um, so we have a family history of bipolar. My family does. And when you're between 19 and 21, the risks of like being pushed into a full bipolar, uh, episode, yeah, episode, it can be, um, it's usually, it can be drugs or some type of really stressful situation, right? I think there's a third thing. I can't remember it right now. Anyway. So it, yeah, his doctor said it was basically the perfect storm. He might never have gone off the deep end as far. He probably would never have gone if he hadn't gone. Maybe he would have. We we won't, we won't ever know, but it just hit, it just split him. Uh, his brain just, just, uh, his uh, therapist after meeting with him for like a month, the therapist he'd been seeing before, she said, she told me, she said, you need to mourn the loss of him. Like he died because that person will never come back. He's too far gone. It's not coming back. And uh, I have worked with him uh, over the last, I think it's been a year and a half now that he's been home and he he goes, he gets better. He doesn't get better. He gets better. Um, So I don't take that like uh, as the one and only truth or opinion, (laughs) but it does seem to be like we're getting there. She said there might be a day where you'll have to put him on adult social security. Like this literally might not ever totally resolve itself. So, um, this is where I'm going to hit my breaking point. <laughs> so he comes back. Go, go, go. Okay. So he comes back and, um, gets a lot of treatment, gets treated for PTSD. Um, just really works hard, but, but, um, 
decides he's going to go back to BYU Provo instead of Idaho. I had I'd had him reserved at both places. <laughs> I'm a mastermind at uh, colleges. They just both didn't know he was going to both places. So anyway, um, I had him reserved at both, like, no, deferred, it's called. Deferred at both places. And um, he decides, he come, he came home, I think it was in May. His sister got married in June. Um, my oldest got married in the temple in June. And then um, just spent the whole summer just, I, I want to get, I want to go back to BYU. I want to go back, to, I just want to get back. But um, I had him, I enrolled him in some UVU Institute classes, the required one, which is foundations of the whatever. And then, um, so he starts taking that and somebody sent him the CES letter too at some point, but, um, the Institute class, these teachers are teaching this stuff now. Teaching what? The one was like, the Bible's all made up. It's just symbolic. The Adam and Eve story is symbolic. That's what I believe. And then the foundation stuff goes through the four verse visions, it, four, four versions of the first vision. It goes through a lot of the messy history stuff from a from a a bit of a, well, I don't know, because I didn't take the class. But he comes home and he's starting they're, to- They're basically trying to inoculate the the youth of today. Absolutely. So that when they hear they stuff from Mormon crisis. stories of the CES letter or just factual history books, they don't, they don't get shocked by it and right. leave. Right. Right, but he's saying, my MTC president yelled at me when I talked about this, and I just taught that this wasn't true. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Four months later, you're telling me this is all true? So he starts going through his own um, faith crisis, and he gets to the point um, over that summer where he's super suicidal. Um, he goes to the Provo Temple, the new one, and he's posting on social media uh, stuff about he's really mad at the church and about the prophet. I didn't, I didn't get to see it because I wasn't, I'm not on, I use social media to monitor my kids, but I, at this point I wasn't on social media. Uh, so I hear about it, but, um, I believe the police were called because he was like, the church has ruined my life here. I spent my whole life wanting to serve for them. I went and served them. They put me in a dangerous situation. He, he saw people, he said he saw people get killed. Like when he was there, he was, he was more, he, there was just things that happened to him that he felt like. They didn't protect him, and they should have. And then he comes home and finds out it's all it, his, he'd been lied to, and he was just um, posting all this stuff in a suicidal state. So um, he ends up coming home, and um, I get him back with the doctor, and, and I'm working through the medically stuff, medical stuff, and the bishop reaches out to me and says, "What can I do to help?" And I'm like, "Stay, stay the hell away from him." Because it's you leaders that are like, the, be, because um, all, I, I forgot this part. One of the biggest PTSD things he had was interviews now with the leaders, especially bishop interviews. Because he's sitting in there and he's, and, and he's not allowed to say what he thinks. And he's, he was so traumatized by the MTC experience, he just can't. It, it literally could send him off into man, mania like that. So I was like, don't you ever interview him. Like, and at this point, I already wasn't letting my children be interviewed because of my second daughter and my fourth, two of my other kids' experiences and just their anxiety with interviews and stuff. So, and so I already was against that. And I was like, just don't do it. Don't interview him. And um, before this, he had interviewed him a few times, and I would find out later that um, my son had been talking to my bis the bishop about his faith crisis, and the bishop said, well, I'm the judge in Israel. You don't get to make these decisions. These are you know, like, you just, you come to me and I'll tell you what's right and what's wrong or something like that. I really love this man, but I was really mad when I found out about this. So I, so I just give him that instruction. I'm like, if you really want to help, stay the hell away from him. That's li uh, literally what I said. I said, don't, don't just, I said, he, the, you're, and I, I didn't feel like he's not a doctor and he's not his dad. I don't have to tell him why. So I didn't tell him why. I just said, don't talk to him. Don't interview him. Don't do any, you know, stay away from him. So he gets, um, he does every type of therapy you possibly can, gets, pulls himself together, gets ready to go to BYU. He's so excited. He's got, B, uh, he's staying on campus, gets in BYU Provo. It's the night before he's supposed to move out. And he's like, he's like, I have to come back. I, we, we move in on Monday, but Tuesday I'm going to walk back. Cause I have a, I have an interview with the state president here. I'm like, what? I was like, why do you have an interview? He's like, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it, mom. Cause he doesn't want me to get involved. I'm like, why, why would you have an interview with the state president? So I'll, I'll back up and, and tell his version. So I guess what happened after that um, posting, his, the bishop took away his temple recommend. I didn't know this. 
At some point, he found out about it, and he thought if you didn't have an active temple recommend, you couldn't go to BYU. So he thought, crap, I need to meet with the bishop. So he had been meeting with the bishop. He'd already met with him twice to get a uh, temple recommend and to BYU stuff and, was, and had to go meet with the stake president. I was livid. I mean, kill somebody livid. Why? Mom, I've told that bishop to stay the hell away from us. I said, don't talk to him. And I just spent $20,000 probably, 20,000 hours on his medical care to get him to a level where he could go to school. One interview with the bishop's going to F that up. That's because it's a trigger for him. Like, Bishop doesn't have to know that, but mom knows that. And I, I told him that for a reason. So I was really mad. And, and I really do love this man because he's, he's just in a, a bad situation. And the church puts these poor, these poor men. So I don't, I don't want to throw him personally under the bus. But I'm like mulling around the house like, what should we ask? If there's no way in hell you're going to that stake president interview. I'm talking to these guys. And, and I, he was like, what are you going to do, mom? Don't like, <laughs> this is the, the hillbilly elegy. I'm going to go kill somebody right now. <laughs> it's like, just go to your room. Don't worry about what I'm going to do. Anyway, so I, I said something to somebody, and I, I can't say who it was, but they were saying, you should just call the bishop and tell him to say the F away from so-and-so. So I said, that's exactly what I'm going to do. So I called the bishop, and he says, hello, how is, how's it going? I said, what the hell did you not understand when I said stay the F away from my son? And I, I said it. And um, mm. he was like, oh. He's like, well, he contacted me. I said, because you took away his temple recommend. And he said, but... You're, so you're saying even as an adult, I can't wait with him? I said, I'm pretty sure that's what I said before. And so then I start, I told him, this is one of his previous scout leaders. I said, you don't love him. You don't care about him or you wouldn't have done this. And I said, it's not, it's not my job to tell you. I said, you're not a mental health professional. I don't have to tell you the whys, you, but, you, but you need to honor it. Anyway, so we had this whole back and forth, and every time I said stay that, I probably said the F word 30 times in the space of 30 Whoa. minutes. Uh, yeah, this is, this is really upset mama. And um, uh, every time I said, what, the, what, what did you not understand about stay the F way? He goes, well, my job is to protect the good name of the church. I'm like, are you trying to make me matter? Like it's at this point, he doesn't know I'm going through a faith crisis. I'm like at the end of my faith crisis already, just barely hanging on, you know? And my daughter at this point had just gotten married in the temple. So I was just like, I'm at least going to stay in for her. I'm at least going to stay in for her because I wanted to not miss her temple ceiling. What do you think he meant by that? His job was to protect the good name of the church. Because my son had posted on social media that um, he was being lied to and the prophet was crap. So anyway, that's what he felt like I had to take it away from him. I'm like, yeah, but you didn't have to interview him. He goes, well, he contacted me. I said, yes, but you should have, like, said, hey, reached out to me. Like, I told you not to do this. He had already met, met with him twice. And um, I said, but I said, this is what you're going to do. You're going to put his temple recommend back. I said, you're going to, you, because I said, because when he goes to BYU tomorrow, the last thing he needs to do is to have a red flag on his name. And that's what will happen. Because his new bishop is going to be like, oh, this kid's temple recommend got revoked. What happened here? I said, he just gave a goddamn four months of his life. He's totally off, fallen off the rocker because of the church. And you want to punish him more? I said, you're going you're gonna to reinstate that. I said, and this is the analogy I gave him. I said, let's pretend, let's pretend that, I'll just use his name because he won't care. Sterling's standing at the top of a cliff. Okay, standing at the top of the cliff. And you and the church pushed him off the cliff because that's what happened on his mission. You literally pushed him off the cliff. While he's falling and flaying in his arms, he's like, the prophet's an alien. I was like, I don't care what he said. I don't care if he said the prophet's a prostitute. I don't care what he said. <laughs> he's freaking falling. He's almost, to, he's literally going to commit suicide. That's how bad this is. And you want to worry about protecting the good name of the church? You better, you better believe it. You come over and say that to my face. I am going to hurt you. Like that is not okay for you to say that. It is not okay for you to treat my kid like that. My kids is a freaking human being and he's a person. And, and they did, by the way, they reinstated his temple <laughs> recommend. Wow. They're like, Oh, she's really mad. And, and so, and then I, and that's I, called revelation is what that is. Yeah. That's called inspiration. It's, it's, it's called people are scared of Gretchen. <laughs> and so, um, and I was like, and you don't ever interview him again. Like we, we've established that now, right? <laughs> and um, 
Yeah. And so they did. He 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 hung up. He called me right back. He goes, I talked to the state president. We re, we reissued his temple recommend. It's all good to go. He's not going to have to meet with anyone. I'm like, good. Um, <laughs> so then he goes to BYU before I even have a chance to call the new bishop. The new bishop calls him in because of uh, something he said in his testimony. I think he was like, I don't know if I believe this is all true or something. Because Sunday was the first day. It was like they moved in on Saturday. And he's just being honest. <sighs> No, but I mean, he is. He's been I know honest. he is, but I'm like, we, at this point, my advice to him had been for ever since he came home, I said, lie to the bishop. <laughs> that was my advice because I know he couldn't, he couldn't, uh, I knew he'd get it. If I said, I said, if you want to go to a church school, you have to lie to the bishop. That's what I said. What, what part of this doesn't sound insane, right? Like listening back to myself, I'm like, what, 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 what was I thinking? But, um, it's not me. It's them. It's the church. I said, go on, go on campus, get a therapist, tell the therapist everything you don't agree with. Tell the therapist everything you feel. Don't tell it to your bishop. And he did do that. But he also told it to his bishop. <laughs> so it didn't work out. Anyway, so he, he gets called in to the bishop. And his, his version of uh, what happened, what this bishop's version is, two different things. But he calls me right after. He's like, I want to sue the church and I want to sue this bishop. You should have heard all the questions he was asking me. And he, I could see the level of mania starting. What happened? Uh, the bishop just called him in and was like, you know, you need to have a testimony of the Book of Mormon because he said he didn't know if he did. And you need, and like, what, what does, what's your mom's position? He was like asking about his parents and like being like, oh, well, maybe if your mom doesn't believe, then this is her fault. And just, just um, saying things like, he said, he said to him like, well, you know, um, if you ever have sex outside of wedlock, like you take away that, that woman's, she'll never be, she'll never be hundred percent whole again. You take away something that she'll never get back. Like you rob her of that. Like, and just, just things about like, just giving him advice, but, um, basically saying you need to believe this, like just lean on me, but you don't get it. You don't have the choice of, of, of doubt or that type of stuff. So I called, so, and so he calls me, he's like, I'm sure I'm going to get kicked out. He's going to, he's, he's going to, he's going to, and in his, this is kind of a bipolar tendency anyway, too. It's like, I'm going to lose all my credits, things that aren't really going to happen, but all this stuff. And, um, he starts to go into a manic, he starts, yes, he, he starts, starts to break, which is exactly what I told our current Bishop. Don't meet with him because I've got him stabilized. You meet with him and it, he, it could set him up. This is exactly what I predicted. Moms are usually right. <laughs> Anyway, so um, I call this bishop, and I have to smooth it over. And I said, look, he's, he, he's had, he has all these mental health problems. Please never interview him again. This isn't a good idea. And, um, and um, he actually leaves him alone. But he, it started a cycle of mania that he was – then he was like um, – my, my, my roommates wanted to go to the temple and I told them I didn't want to go because it's all made up, made up on mason, mason, masonry. And they were like, you're reading anti-Mormon stuff. And he's like, it's on LDS.org. So he just can't keep his mouth shut. You know, I'm like, maybe a church school isn't a good idea. But is that bad? Like, it's weird that what we're basically saying is you need to lie to go to a religious school. Yeah. And we're basically saying being honest is wrong. Don't be honest, which by the way, is kind of what got you in trouble. Because you, you know, you were obeying authority and silencing, no, noticing that you couldn't be honest, and then blowing up inside, dying inside, because you had to stay quiet. And right. this is a recipe for illness for anyone. Yeah, it's it's so it's so so abusive, and that's why I hope that they change it. I be it, there should be no interview process on belief uh, it's at any school. Yeah, that that should be outlawed like that. Yeah. That's just, it's so abusive. And, um, or even the fact I blame the leaders, Nelson, Oaks, Hinckley, Monson, I blame them to the extent of when he's talking about masonry with his roommates, it's already on LDS.org, right? But they didn't teach it in Sunday school. They didn't teach it in priesthood. They didn't regularly teach it. So for them to hide their little underneath saying we're transparent because we put it in these LDS.org essays, when everybody doesn't know about it or BYU students don't know about it, they automatically or assume. Or bishops or stake presidents. Or you're anti. Oh, you're anti. Oh, you're anti. That's, 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 that's like, it, you know, you know what? I'm a victim of abuse, actually. I'm not anti anything. And that's so abusive to make the the victim 
be the bad guy. And that's that's the worst part, I think, of Mormonism, is that victims are now portrayed as apostate. Victims are anti because they tell their story. Victims are, no, you know what? They put it in the essay. They should be teaching it to every GD person in Brazil, in Russia, in America. Everybody needs to learn it, and everybody needs to be on the same page. Or, and or, just not have a one truth philosophy. You know what? Research what you want about Joseph Smith. Believe what you want. We love you anyway. Research what you want about the Book of Mormon. You can believe it symbolically. You can believe it literally. We love you anyway. Believe the Bible. Believe Christ is literal. Believe he's not. We love you anyway. I mean, that's what a healthy religion would look like. Well, what did this do to your son? He ended up being hospitalized. He, uh, mm-hmm. uh, I had just had surgery and I'd just come out and just gotten home, and I got a text from his bishop saying, we don't know where Sterling is. Is he with you? I was like, no. And he went missing for about three days, I want to say. Mm, that's a- and he said, and they said the last thing he said was that he was feeling suicidal, and he just disappeared. He asked the BYU police to take him to the hospital. And I have HIPAA. I, I'm, I'm, I, I have, but he went to the hospital that's not under our insurance. So I lost track of him and nobody would give us any information. So I'm like half drugged, just coming out of, of uh, surgery and um, I can't drive. Uh, and my husband was supposed to be taking care of the little girls and I don't know who to call. And um, also one of the things I know from mania, because I have a parent with mania, is... Um, Anybody could be the bad guy. So I'm like, am I going to be a good guy in this story or am I going to be a bad guy? And if you're the bad guy, even if you haven't done anything wrong, um, they think you're the bad guy. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm half drugged and I need help and I call her. And I'm like, but you can't tell your husband. Can you just watch my girls? Don't tell them why they're there. Like I just, I said, if Sterling finds out that I, call, that I called any, your family. It, it, and anyway, so we go through... I go through about two and a half days of we don't know where he is. We don't know if he's alive. We don't know if he's dead. Um, The hospital gave up a little bit of information. So we believed that he was at a psych ward that was close to us. We went there. They wouldn't tell us. Um, So I make myself an appointment with his therapist (laughs) because I'm having a total breakdown. Oh, and I'm supposed to be taking meds, but I just go off all my meds because I'm like, I got to be alert. I gotta be like some if something happens, I can't be on I can't be on an opioid. You know, so I'm like in a ton of pain, but just trying to muss through it, um, not doing well. But um finally find out that he's there, finally uh get to get in there and he's like, Yeah, I didn't tell you because I was afraid you'd talk to the bishop. It was the same thing. It was exactly what I predicted, the mania thing. I didn't want you to know where I was and um he spent a week there, helped, helped uh, try to help redo his meds, um, ended up dropping out of BYU. Again, going through, um, I can't remember what it's called, but we tried another alternative therapy. He did that and um, decided, well, I'm just going to go back to BYU, Idaho. We hadn't even told BYU, Idaho he was back from his mission, <laughs> and he had a scholarship waiting there. So we just pretend like he hadn't been to BYU Provo and just send in, hey, I got back early to BYU, Idaho. So um, he, he gets an apartment there. This time, mm. I'm proactive about everything. So I handpick, his sister was living there. So we go, we handpick his roommates. We handpick, we talk to the bishop before he even goes there. Look, this is the situation. Don't ever interview him. Pick, like I said, if, if he can have the right infrastructure, and he's hell-bent on going to school. I'm thinking maybe you just shouldn't go to school for a while. But he really uh, wanted to go. And he only had, we actually looked at him going to UVU, but um, the way the t- credits transfer, he only had six credits left to finish his associates through, B- through BYU. But at UVU, he would have had to almost start over. They were only going to count him as electives. Yeah, church schools. So going to BYU-Idaho, it, w- it was a better fit. So he gets there, um, just the most amazing roommates. They all know the situation. They're wonderful with him. The bishop never talks to him because by this time, I think everybody's pretty scared of me. <laughs> my my kids used to tease that um, at the high school counselor's office, there's like a picture of my face. And when the phone rings and it's my, my number, everyone's like, oh, I did it last time. I'm not talking to her. So um, anyway, so he didn't have any major exp- bad experiences except he just started getting depressed. And he went to a therapist there. You know how they have the three therapy 
the free therapy. And that therapist was saying, you should stop taking this med. You should, it was giving him advice he shouldn't be giving him because he's not his doctor. Yeah, psychologists can't do And that. so, um, or, or that's what he was telling me. He was telling me, I mean, maybe that's, maybe he got it wrong, but I was like, yeah, you can't just go off a of med while you're, you can't do that. So he got, he got depressed and I said, why don't you just, just come back home? So he came home and this was right before COVID. So we, he only needed um, 16 total credits to graduate. Six were generals. Maybe it was 14 credits. Anyway, um, so we decided we'll just do the spring semester, but do it all online. So we signed up for everything online and then it ended up being COVID in there, but it's online anyway. Um, and then he ended up getting his associates, but from our house. And um, then he ended up going to UVU and um, getting him out of the church school was the best thing ever because he loves it now. He's like, he goes, mm, he wears, he's very really? Christian. He wears a cross to church and blue jeans. Mm. And he's like, I go in and have bishop interviews all the time, but they don't have any power over me. So I'll say, what do you believe? Interesting. Well, this is what I believe. And they can't control me. Mm. They don't get a control. And, and we've gone over this because I'm like, well, if you ever meet someone who wants to get married in the temple, you'll, actually, you'll have to go through a temple recommend interview again. And so we've practiced. It's, it's number 10 in my book, What's Healthy and Not Healthy in Interviews. And um, we practice with them. And I, so if they say something that makes you uncomfortable, you say, I didn't give you permission to ask me that. My therapist said, that's not okay. And, and he knows that. So um, I don't know if he'll stay or if he'll leave, uh, but he goes up and he goes down. And it'll be interesting to see what happens. A couple, couple just quick reactions. Uh, one is that you would think that church leaders – following the example of Christ, not to pile on anyone. Cause I really do believe everyone's a victim here and everybody's trying their best. Yeah, I agree. Most of these people are good people, but, but when they're in the position of, of being watchmen on the towers of guarding the church's good name, this whole worthiness thing and this whole, like we have to protect people's testimonies, you know, a, a special witness of Christ or, you know, a Bishop, a leader of a flock, someone who follows Jesus, whatever, you would think rule number one of following Jesus is put the person over everything else, but they're literally defending the institution at the expense of the individual. It's like, it's like protecting the 99, sacrificing the one to protect the 99. And that's, that's messed up. The fact that, um, you know, your son and you and everyone is feeling like you have to lie and, and shut these bishops up and tell them what to say and what not to say. And that your your son just can't be healthy and authentic and question naturally, um, and doubt and and even go through a, a regular normal, normative developmentally appropriate experience of doubting and questioning and even disbelieving in college, you can't have that right. Um, so unhealthy. Yeah, so but unhealthy. but but the fact that he's bipolar, like, and they're making it worse. That's all just totally unacceptable. But but then. I guess as as the climax, I'm thinking, well, really what's going on here is your son isn't well and he shouldn't be in college. And it doesn't matter where he goes at this point, he's going to just struggle. And maybe that's true, but he goes to a non-church school. And what happens? Like you would think a secular school would not be what makes him better, but that that seems like the, the worst possible outcome from the church's perspective, that his healing starts when he leaves the religious school. It shouldn't. Absolutely. Shouldn't the religious school be the safest place <laughs> to be, the most healing, the most nurturing? I don't want any of my kids to go th unless they they stop those interviews. I mean, I love the the kids and the experiences they have, but yeah, those interviews are so abusive. Um, to tell someone that that you have you get a that you get to control their beliefs, you get to control their sexuality, you get to control. And that if they don't give you that control, they are bad. That's what those, that's you get what, to de you get you're to determine, a bad person. You get to determine their worthiness. Yes, that's the absolutely. worst part of all is that some man gives you the, gives you the impression, gives you, intimidates you at the, at the sake of getting kicked out of school. Absolutely. That he gets to decide for God, whether you're a worthy human being or not, and whether you get to continue in your school or lose a semester or two or three or four worth of time and money, it, there's a lot of suicide and depression and anxiety in these church schools, and, the, and this is the system where it happens. And that's interesting because it's it, that's number ten. Number ten in my book 
uh, you might be in an unhealthy group if the group questions members about their worthiness or purity. goes on. Then it tells you what, what is healthy. You were born worthy of love. A healthy group would not question your innate worthiness. A healthy group would serve to enhance your inner feelings of love. Healthy groups would provide leaders with professional mental health training. Use youth-initiated conversations of trust and guidance. And in the case where abuse or guidance is outside the parameters of leaders' training, such as sexual questions and your sexuality, marriage counseling, abuse, etc., they would refer you to licensed mental health professionals. The church did that one thing. Could you imagine? And even Stephen Hassan, a cult expert, will say it never is useful to tell a member of a cult that they're in a cult. And, you know, there's a lot of good about the LDS church, so this is confusing. And on Mormon Stories, I try and never use that word, never try and refer to the church as a cult. But I just want to reiterate what you just said. These, uh, these books, these cult experts know very little about Mormonism. They've focused on other religions. These, this bite model that a, that an unhealthy religion and or a cult tries to control your behavior, tries to control the information that you receive, tries to control your thoughts, and then, and then tries to control your emotions. And I will add manipulate you through emotions and through behavior control and through harsh punishments and judgments of your worthiness. This is what cults do. And this is why there's such an epidemic of suicidality amongst youth and young adults in Utah and in church-related high schools and church-related uh, colleges and anxiety and depression and prescription drug abuse because of the pressure cooker, you know, that, that, it, that, that, that can come from Mormonism and or church-related schools. Right. 